So how many developers are here? Wow, quite the crowd. How many DevOps engineers? IT? OK, cool. So it doesn't happen that often that you kind of encounter a technology that's exceedingly relevant for all of these groups. So um, I don't know how, how much you're familiar with open telemetry at the moment. Who's familiar with it? Who's used it? Perfect. So for those of you who are not familiar with it, I hope to give you some background. This is not a how-to or tutorial. There are just so many of them out there that I don't aim to replace them. What this session is about, though, is something else entirely. Because there is one thing, which is to have access to a technology. And another thing is how to make it useful. And this session is about how do we actually take this new thing, this new toy, and make it useful or meaningful or impactful in the dev process. So just some background about me. Um, I've been kind of dabbling in different ways in which we can improve dev processes for a while now in multiple capacities. I was both a developer, a scrum master, um, um, product manager. And throughout that journey, I was noticing something that really bothered me. And I was in multiple kind of organizations, and we were all trying to do something very similar, which is there was a big demand to accelerate, to deploy faster, to go to continuous deployment. And I felt something was missed. And I want to start this talk by telling you about a story um, that is really kind of symptomatic of what I noticed. And this is the story of a developer in my team called Bill. And Bill was given a task, one that is very routine for developers. And that task is go develop something, then see it all the way to production. Now, it used to be that this task was exceedingly simple. Well, I don't want to say simple, but it was well-defined. When I got started as a developer 20 years ago, developing a feature and was defined as follow. Go code the feature, pack it up real nicely, then hand it over to the guys across the hall in the QA department. They'll take it from there. And this was what, where my responsibility ended. But today, that's not the case anymore. And when we talk about Bill's responsibility as, some, as somebody who needs to take this piece of functionality, maybe modify an existing feature or add something new to the system. For the sake of example, let's say we ask them to add some caching to the data access layer or something like that. And now he needs to think about unit tests, integration tests, sometimes about how to deploy the feature. There are many developers today that know how Helm charts work and how Terraform modules work because they need to know that in order to deploy their feature. So everything is shifting right, and Bill has done all of that. He's a great developer. He developed all of the tests. He thought about the test covered. He thought about how to deploy it to production. He's done with the feature. And my question to you, what happens next? What happens the minute after Bill decided to merge uh, his pull request and this gets automatically deployed? And let me ask you, what happens next where you work? 
a developer completed the feature, deployed it into production, what's the first thing he does then? Exactly. He moves on to the next feature. He completely forgets everything that he's just done and he just moves on. Now, here are the things that I expected Bill to do after he, he, was, he was done. I, I was expecting him to check, did it actually work? Is anyone using it? Now, I was personally witnessing more than one occasion where meticulously written code was never executed because somebody made a bad if statement or some other silly mistake, and nobody noticed. Why? <laughs> because Bill's job ended when he clicked that merge button. But even beyond such trivial things like, did it actually run? Did it make life better for everyone? You spent so much time optimizing that caching for the data access layer. Is it working? Is it improving the quality of life for other pieces of code. And instead, just like you said, he would just reach on to the next feature. And this bugged me. It bugged me qu uh, quite a great deal and kind of uh, took me on a journey to try and figure out what is that component that we're missing and why it isn't happening. And I'll tell you a little spoiler. Even though I explicitly told Bill to do it and everybody else on the team, and I tried my best to kind of force the hands of all of the developers to do differently, they kept going back to that natural instinct of dropping the ball, moving on. So to get some inspiration, I looked, um, I took a look at the infinite loop diagram that, you know, by now is, I think, completely overused. But still, um, it's kind of a model of how we like to think about the way that we develop end to end. But this time, as I was looking at the diagram, something seemed extremely off here. Does anybody notice something very weird about this diagram that I found online? It's just uh, supposed to show you different tools that pertain to different kind of stages of the DevOps cycle. Okay, we'll come back to this. We have some uh, around operations. There are some monitoring tools here, I guess. But something is still off. We'll come back to that in a sec. <laughs> here is how, here is maybe a more simplified version of the DevOps loop. Basically, you code, you test, you deploy. Then you code again. Then you test again. Then you deploy. Then you code again. Then you test again. Then you deploy. This is the definition of the DevOps iteration. It's not a definition of a loop. The fact that this is a loop doesn't mean that at the end we start again. A loop implies there is a continuous process. Now, this kind of forward-looking thinking is a bias that exists across the organization, and I can tell you that as a product manager. Because whenever Bill, when I was a product manager, whenever Bill would come back to me proudly saying he completed the feature, I thought, what about the next one? And there's a reason for that, you know? I'm, I'm, as a product manager, I'm responsible for the roadmap. I'm looking ahead. I need to com you know, conquer the next hill. And this is done. He said it's done. It's done. Why should I care about it? But what does a loop really mean? What does a feedback loop really mean? It means that you're getting information back. And today, we're getting information back from our local environments as we, dev to, as we develop to some extent. Why do I say to some extent? Because I caught developers doing the weirdest things to try and notice things that are missing. 
So it's not like we're completely noticing everything that's going on as we're making code changes, and we'll talk about that in a sec, but we are getting some feedback. We're getting limited feedback back from the testing environment, limited because it's mostly kind of true, false, pass, fail. It's not very qualitative. It doesn't tell us the answer to any of these questions that I wanted Bill to answer, like, is life better for everybody after his change? And it, that's not always an easy question to answer. But as developers, we're getting almost no feedback from production. We rolled out this code. Is it scaling well? What's going on with it? Is the error rate increasing? So going back to the diagram, you'll notice that there is actually here an error going in the other direction. It actually says continuous feedback, an amazing name. It actually repeats itself in many of the similar diagrams that I came across on the web. And for some reason, the author of this specific diagram thought that Salesforce was the right tool to allocate in that specific slot. Ignoring that for a second, why is there absolutely no tool associated with continuous feedback? Think about how forward wired we are to have so many continuous integration platforms, so many continuous deployment platforms, but nobody's thinking about what does a continuous feedback platform look like. So I was thinking to myself, as I was trying to get the team to operate differently, that maybe the problem is a problem of data. And I thought, well, if only we had access, instant access, to objective data about our code in every, any different environment in a, at any given time. And this is the perfect segue to talk about open telemetry. And purposely, I'm not talking about open telemetry from the techni technological innovation point of view. I want to talk about how it can be useful to, to me, as a developer, as a DevOps engineer, as somebody who cares about the release process. Because open telemetry essentially is just a way to collect that data that would allow Bill to say, whoa, I see my code is terrible, or I see my code is awesome. Now, why is open telemetry important? So, Several people here raised their hands. They said they, 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 you already are using or are familiar with open telemetry. Why do you think it's important? Yeah? You can gather real-time metrics from the production and look at those to see how things are doing. That's true. But there are other technologies that allow you to do that. You're using an ATM. There are a lot of proprietary profilers. Uh, standards to gather information and so on. So, so combining the different sources, like traces, mm -hmm. metrics, and the logs. That's one thing, and that's why there is this triangle here, because yes, it's combining traces, the, the, the holy trinity of uh, traces, metrics, and logs. But beyond that, something groundbreaking happened with open telemetry, and it ha has nothing to do with a technological breakthrough. In fact, it's not very innovative. It combined previous standards like OpenTrace and OpenCensus. But it did something that didn't happen before. It got everybody to agree that this is the right way to collect data. And in the field, such as software engineering, that's a next to impossible task. Mm -hmm. And what's happening right now, amazingly, is that this consensus has crossed the language boundaries, has crossed the platform boundaries. So you have people that are coding in Node, in Python, Django, or Fast API. They're using .NET and ASP.NET MVC that are using uh, Golang and Mux. It doesn't matter. They all agreed, OK, there is one open source fundamental way to collect observability, and we're going to use that. 
And the ripple effect of that, and it happens to be open source. And, and, and everybody can extend it and add additional value on top of it. And the ripple effect of that is that if I'm a platform owner, if I'm responsible for developing Java Spring, then it makes it very easy for me to know what I need to support in terms of opening up my platform to support observability. I don't need to worry about the Datadog uh, or the new Relic proprietary way to do it. I just say, oh, well, I support all of them. And this is huge because it means for us as users, that support is already included in the platforms we use. It means that the gap between having code that I don't know anything about and getting almost too much information about it is just flipping a switch. And we'll take a look at a few examples of that. Now, I'm going to show you an example, a few, exa a few sample applications. This specific one is written in Python. I wanted to, I'm allergic to sample applications that are essentially just CRUD apps that don't actually have any useful logic. So I started making up an application. In this case, it's for, I was watching the Harry Potter films with my kids at the time. So it's basically an API for the Green Gospel. And it's using RabbitMQ, it's using Postgres, it's using an external API, it's using all sorts of technology. So let's, let's start that and see um, how it actually impacts my work. So so I started my application and now let's kind of uh, do a flow. So let me log into the application. Awesome, and this is a pretty standard uh, fast API app. Um, I can trigger, let's say, a few actions. Let's say I want to get an appraisal for my vault. So I can add the vault number and trigger this API. And then let's say I want to see what does the vault appraisal look like. So I hit this and I get back uh, information about my vault, or an error in this case, which is better actually. Good. Um, so the question is, what is happening behind the scenes? How much do I know about what is happening behind the scenes? Now I can debug it, sure, but I'm making changes all the time, and it's not always that I'm kind of keeping track about what's going on as the code is running. I can try to run tests, which will tell me functionally whether it's doing anything or not. But it will not tell me whether I have some query issues, where, whether I have some um, um, connection pool problem, whether I have a cache miss. It will not tell me a lot of useful things that I should know about when I'm developing. So how do I kind of, especially in, uh, right now I'm running in dev, think about tests that are creating these data this data all the time and production environments, how do I kind of make this a bit more transparent for me as a developer so that I can immediately see what's going on? So I'm not going to go into how it's done in each language. You just need to believe me when I'm saying that for each language, open telemetry, because of the support that I mentioned, is the experience of basically turning the lights on. And I'll just show you an example in this application. In some other applications, it's actually, for example, in Java, it doesn't even require any code changes at all, not even kind of turning the lights on. So in this specific fast API application, all I need to do was to import uh, the metrics uh, instrumenter for Prometheus. And then in addition to that, I have um, some Boiler uh, plate code that basically says instrument, 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 instrument. That's it. Basically, turn on, turn on, turn on, turn on. And some boilerplate around where do I want to send that information. And all of that is a part of the open telemetry package. 
And we'll take a look in a sec about how this scales and how I can collect information for multiple applications. But the bottom line of this is that I had to add maybe 10 lines of code. And suddenly, all of these dis different frameworks, and you can see kind of the fast API and the logging and the request are, are automatically instrumented. And I didn't go through my code like you would do with logging and say, I want to log this and I want to know what happens uh, when this uh, uh, code is called. This happened automatically. So from that perspective, when I now want to go through this code, I want to maybe understand, and I just performed like four actions. I want to look at those actions as a whole. Like for those of you who may be familiar with logging, you can write a log message. And by the way, logging by itself is completely misused often as a standard. If anybody here has ever seen, has ever seen a logger error quote unquote here statement in their code, then they know what I'm talking about. But basically logging is a very inefficient way to save data because it was essentially developed in an age where all we had was things we saved in files. And that's no longer the case. So what I would like to know is what is the flow that just happened when I click those, uh, when, I, when I invoke those API calls? So essentially it was call, calling the fast API service, then some jobs got enqueued in Rabbit, then a worker service got called, and it was communicating with Postgres. That's the higher level flow. And in tracing terms, for those of you who are not familiar with tracing, that's called a trace. And then within a trace, we have um, a breakdown into what we call spans. And each span is kind of an activity within that trace. So, for example, between the time that we got the request to Fast API and when we enqueued a job in RabbitMQ, we got the HTTP request, maybe we deserialized it, we checked permission, we did some validations. Each of these pieces is basically a segment that I want to take a look at. And the way I think about it is we're basically, if we don't have a way to kind of look at it in a hierarchy uh, and, and in an organized manner and in context, we're essentially picking up messages here and there without understanding the context. Now, behind the scenes, to make this work, I already said that I had to add some boilerplate code in some languages that even that's not required, it's just done via environment variables. I also set up a container called a collector. Collector is a part of the open telemetry standard. And what it does essentially is it's a router for observability. You tell it via a simple YAML file what information to ingest and where to send it to. In my case, I said collect all of the open telemetry tracing and send it over to another open source tool, which we'll see in a sec called Jaeger, which is a, a great way to visualize the tracing. Now going back to the original diagram, all of these purple spots are automatic instrumentation. So when I said before, you know what, the platforms already support open telemetry, you don't need to actually do heavy lifting, this is it. So fast API already instrumented, I turned it on. SQL Alchemy, it's a, kind of like an ORM already instrumented, I turned it on. Pika is a library you would use for Rabbit, I just turned it on. All of these different um, kind of um, intermediary points, the libraries that I'm using, are already emitting data. It's just a matter of looking at them. So let's take a look at what the data looks like for the specific request that I just made. So I have uh, a Jaeger instance up and running. I can look at the traces. And for example here, I can see what an, um, what an appraisal request looked like. And notice that I have it working across multiple services because it is a distributed trace. So I have the goblin worker, which is one service. It doesn't need to be even in Python. In this case, it just happens to be. And I have the vault service. 
and I can see what does that request look like. What actually happened when I call that API? And you can see a lot of this stuff was happen automatically. For example, here I can see the select statement. Uh, I can go and see the actual select statement that was occurring as a part of that request. And it happened automatically. I didn't need to add a single line of log. It happened because the specific um, uh, library I was using, SQL Alchemy, has automatic instrumentation, just like most of the other libraries I was using. And in this way, I can really understand what's going on, what is the anatomy of a request. At the same time, I also, and by the way, all of these examples, including the setup of the observability, is available in, in a public repo that I'll give you a link to at the end of the session if you want to kind of try it out yourself. At the same time, there are metrics. So I also wanted to connect to collect metrics. And metrics, too, are very easy to collect. I just added a, an import. And then I added two other open source tooling. I used the open source version of Grafana and Prometheus. So to show you how trivial it is, I basically have yeah, I basically have uh, one Docker Compose file. And what it has is a Prometheus instance. This is the open telemetry collector. And then Grafana and then Jaeger. That's it. And when I start that, uh, I immediately get all of the backends that I need. Uh, so in this case, if I check my Grafana, I just downloaded a dashboard for fast API that I found online. And immediately, I'm starting getting metrics as well. And again, zero cost for me to start getting the information out of the project. And this is the key point. The information is so readily available that it's practically already there. The question is, do we look at it? Okay. So I saw this because Open Telemetry only came up like GA around a year ago. And I was mind blown, and then I thought, well, we can do more with it. Like, it's nice to ask Bill after he checked in his code, to check his code, blah, 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 blah. But there's so much we can do. Because it's essentially a loop, right? We're developing new features all the time, and we already have data. So we can start looking at, before I even start developing, I can see, well, what are the requirements? Am I changing a specific area in the code that is an absolute nexus? Every second, millisecond added here will impact multiple other microservices. Is this a high concurrency scenario or a low concurrency one? Um, what is the, like, like there's so much information that I can get from just, even before I start coding the feature and then as I review, I can see what's different, right? I, I can look at the pull request and I can say, wow, you know, the, these specific areas, you should be paying attention to them. Or from the test data that I see associated with your request, there is a lot of interesting differences we should pay attention to. So data is key and we can do a lot of it, a lot with it. But we're not. My experiment failed. I enabled open telemetry in the engineer organization. I gave everybody access to these Jaeger dashboards and Prometheus dashboards. And uh, everybody was patting everybody on the back. And, and, and I talked to Bill, and he went on to do his next feature. And he deployed it. And then he went on to the next feature after that without taking another look. And this is where I reached kind of a boiling point because I said, what's going on here? I'm, I'm missing something very obvious. And remember what I said in the beginning of the talk, this is not about open telemetry. Open telemetry is great. Use it, okay? It's about how do we make it useful? How do we actually use it and not just end up 
with a bunch of pretty dashboards. And I have to tell you, by now, and in the past year, I've visited scores of organizations and discussed telemetry with them. And there was one that impressed me specifically. Uh, it's located in Israel. They have really nice offices. Uh, and I was walking around with their VP of engineering, and he was showing off their amazing LCD screens in the hallway. And each LCD screen was showing a different dashboard. And it looked so impressive, like these scatter charts and these uh, trend lines and alerts. And it, it was really one of the most impressive setups that I've seen. And then I asked him, do your developers actually look at these screens? And he said, well, I'll tell you a secret. I believe some of them think it's a wallpaper. <laughs> it may as well be. So the, the purpose of open telemetry is not to create pretty dashboards, pretty as they are. It is to make them useful. So why isn't everybody using the data? The data is there. What, what stands between us and making it super useful? And I found that there are three things that stand in the way between using that amazing data about our code to improve it and to create a feedback cycle and failing miserably. The first is expertise. And you can think about that when, when I mentioned this story about Bill and asking him, you know, did your change actually make it things better for everyone? It sounds like a very easy question to answer. If you ask somebody to seriously research that, you may end up with a two-week project, which will have ambiguous results. Why? Because data doesn't look nice. It looks like a very abstract drawing where somebody just scattered paint all over the wall. When, when you look at the charts, there is seasonality, there's anomalies, there's all sorts of situations where the system isn't behaving as usual, and then you pick the wrong one. You need a lot of expertise and some statistics 101 and sometimes 201 to be able to remove the anomalies to be, and the outliers, to be able to kind of collect the right data points, to be able to uh, test, uh, do some linear regressions and test for changes. There are a lot of things there. So behind my <laughs> very kind of uh, simplistic ask of, yeah, go see if it makes things better for everyone, is, is, is science, right? You need to know how to do that. It's not that simple. And also, think about the granularity. Like, I showed you a very nice dashboard where you could see the anatomy of a request. That's one request. One. And I'm not sure if it's the most useful one. Would you kind of go through every request? Or how would you start aggregating it and getting to real conclusions? So there needs to be some work happening before it can be made useful. The other aspect is context switching. So context switching is a big problem. It has to do both, in the most simple way, switching between one tool and another, but also think about knowing so many different tools and platforms and technologies and how to navigate them and how to build dashboards and so on. And then the last aspect is that it's kind of a very reactive process when you think about it. And I think this is where I got to the conclusion, either it's continuous or it doesn't happen. Think about tests, right? We were all in the same pool with tests. Nobody wanted to write tests, least of all developers. It was kind of, yes, there were the TDD addicts, the ones that were like completely all in on testing and, and they're really an inspiration, but most developers weren't that way. You actually had to force them to write tests. 
And whenever it was kind of left to the goodwill of the developer to say, hey, I'm going to run the test wait now. Let's see what I found. It was not happening. In the same way, why would I, a developer in his right mind, go fishing for trouble in a dashboard which will end up resulting in more tedious work for me to do because I found issues in my own code that I may as well have you know, slept better at night not knowing about. So if it's not continuous, if it's not a part of the cycle, if the information doesn't get to me automatically, if it doesn't nudge at me, like what are the chances I'm going to go look for it just because? And when I have every interest not to do that. So I think these three factors for all of the conversations that I had really led me to believe that Technology opened up a door, but we need additional tools in order to actually use it. And this is where my personal journey began with continuous feedback. This is why I started working on some open tooling for how do we make that information useful. Now, please make no mistake. If you just enable open telemetry and you have some smart people, you can figure out a lot of things to do with it, okay? Information is like water. It's useful, it will find its places, and people will leverage it. Go and enable OTEL right now, it, 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 it will pay off. But what I'm trying to think about is how do I kind of solve these issues and make sure that when the developer the developer doesn't need to think about these things. That I don't need to think about, hey, how do I test whether this commit is made any change in the system, or should I go and look for that now? But how do we automate that and make that into something that, you know, makes all of these questions integrated into my experience? So Bill could look at the code and know this code is used, or this is a piece of dead, dead code that hasn't been used since 18, 1984. I don't know. Um, but to know that, we need to integrate two things. The code and the data. And my vision was kind of a living documentation. When I look at the code, I can always see what's going on with the code, because the code is in my field of vision. Other things are not. So let me show you kind of what that looks like uh, in my mind. And this is using a platform that I developed called Digma, but I'm not trying to sell you on Digma. I'm just trying to show you kind of what is my vision. There are other tools that are aiming to do the same thing, and I'm really, really glad about it. So what does development look like in a situation where we're A, collecting data, B, processing that data using data science and AI and all of the other things and making it something that is just an asset that's available to me at any given time without paying it another thought. So I'm going to go through the same journey as before. Um, this is a different application so that we don't just show Python. In this case, it is Java. It's actually a standard demo for Java. I know I was, I said before I was allergic to CRUD apps, but, but this is just a sample. So I'm going to, in this case, enable Digma, which is just a plugin in my IDE. And I'm just going to tell Digma to, sorry, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to click things here. Okay. Um, to collect observability data. That's it. Remember when we said turn it on, flip of a switch? This is what we want to get to. Behind the scenes, if we need to activate, add, that, that's fine. Those are details. But from my, in my mind, I just want to collect data about the application. Let's rerun. Now, I believe this is uh, kind of like a pet clinic shop application. So let's see what that looks like. 
and here is my app, and I've developed a new feature. I'm testing out that my code doesn't crash and that it works well. So I can add uh, an owner. Awesome. And I've done some things. I've, I did the exact same thing I did, I did before, which is kind of you know, call, call out some action. Only this time, over here in the IDE, I can start seeing what's going on. And I can see I have information from various environments. This came from my dev environment. And these are the different flows that happen. So I can see there was a get call for uh, the owner. Uh, there was a new post call to create the owner. But now let's look at the code because that's the interesting part. So let's see from the call I made exactly what code was called. And this time, I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. You can see that the information is there. I don't need to look for it. And the expertise for getting to the conclusion about the code is already in the continuous feedback platform. So there is an M plus one situation here. For those of you who are familiar with it, it's kind of like uh, too many queries because of bad modeling and ridiculous ORMs. We have um, this, this specific piece of code is relatively slow in, in, in my system. Uh, and this is the bottleneck. This is what's slowing things down. Um, and there's all sorts of things that I can start understanding about this code and seeing it instead of needing to go look for it or go look for trouble. And I can go a little deeper and let's say I'm interested in kind of that uh, N plus one situation so I can see kind of um, how that happens and I can go all the way to the trace level but the, and, and I can see who's using it and who's affected by it. But the more important aspect of it is that I don't need to go looking for trouble. If, if, if trouble exists, it found me and, and it knows how to show me that in the context of my work. And I can look at that same code and see, well, okay, so how does this code work in production? You know, maybe uh, things are, you know, a bit different in production. And, and you know, they, they often are. And I can see, you know, for example, in this specific operation that I was looking at, if I look at production, I can see, well, there's a scaling issue here. And this code that I wrote, it works fine on my machine, but when I look at the production environment, um, after, you know, a specific uh, um, 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 concurrency level, I can see that there is a performance degradation of almost one and a half seconds per, per concurrent execution, which is a lot. And if I don't believe uh, the system, I can understand and, and see what's going on here. And I can also see the root cause, which is validating the owner with external service. Now, this information is not something that I invented. It was there all along. All that stood, if before, all that stood between me and a developer and getting data about my code is the instrumentation, the observability platform, how do I get actual data? Today, with open telemetry, we moved on one step. Now, all that stands between me and actually using that data is not collecting it. Collection is done, it's, it's solved, I showed you. It's, 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 it's completely trivial. What stands between me and actually using it is the processing of that data, is to get something that's more chewed up, that, that, that I can actually use, instead of millions of millions of you know, rows of logs, traces, or metrics. Now, if you're interested in continuous feedback in your own code or in um, applying some of these tools, practices, or just looking at the examples, uh, you can go to continuousfeedback.org. Uh, we register the domain. Or you can just go to uh, this uh, QR code. It's just a Notion page. 
And it basically contains a link to some of the resources and tools that we talked about. And there's also a Slack channel where we're kind of collecting people that are um, also seeing a lot of impact of this on their daily work and improving the, the, the process um, and sharing some of their experiences and what they're up to. So with that, um, happy to be the, the, the last talk on the day. Uh, it was a pleasure meeting everyone and um, happy to answer any questions. So a lot of times in law, there will be sensitive bits of information, credit card numbers, mm -hmm. social security numbers, and yep. so on and so forth. How do you handle that in open telemetry and things of that? Because so, sometimes those are critical things to know and to be able to say, yes, this is my software for this. That's a great question. And the answer is that open telemetry is a lot less susceptible to that with a few, few caveats. Because generally the information you'll get is more about what activity was called, how long it took, uh, what are some of the errors that you had there. Th these, these, this kind of information. It's not bulletproof. If in my exception I decide to print out the details of the user and his passport for some reason, then there are several things wrong with my code. But this is one of them. Um, at the same time, if I'm using queries that are not um, following best practices and are not using query parameters and are susceptible to SQL injection and other things, then I might see clear text password in my queries, which I shouldn't do anyway. So if you're following best practices, then it shouldn't create any kind of exposure for you in that sense, much less than long. Any other question? Yeah. What about the uh, telemetry collector? Mm -hmm. Just use that as a processor to do the transaction. Yeah, there, and, and you know, this, this is the benefit of having this as an open technology because if you look, like, open telemetry is the second most active CNCF project after Kubernetes. It's, it's extremely active. And it's active in multiple. Um, it, it, as I mentioned, it's, it's kind of this Tower of Babel because it's, it's across different platforms. I talked to a lot of the folks in the Hotel team and some of them are Java guys, some of them are Golang guys, some of them are Node guys. It, and the value that they provide, if somebody creates a processor for a collector, everybody can use it. And, and that's, I think, amazing. So, so yeah, there, there's lots of uh, work being done now especially around what is called collector ops, which is how do you also kind of deploy, scale collectors. Collectors are very sophisticated. I didn't touch on all of what they can do, but essentially they already included things like sampling and um, 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 batching and other things to kind of make it efficient to roll out at scale. I have not seen something standard for that. I had to write it. Um, and there are numerous problems to solve, numerous ones. Uh, you need to think about clustering the data, you need to think about um, what's normal, what's not normal, what's anormal. You need to understand what constitutes a change, okay? Uh, you need to remove things like one of the nice things that we got for free by being an IDE plugin <coughs> is we know if you're stuck in a breakpoint, so we know not to tell you hey, your execution time is up by 20 seconds because you stopped in a breakpoint and thought about something. So it, it has to accommodate for a lot of things, for the fact that production is seasonal and you get, uh, and, and some variables are tied together. Like think about the fact that if you think about it simply, um, and I tell you, you know what, your function is now 40% slower, that could be very inaccurate if it's 40% slower because it's accommodating 4,000% more users at the same time. So what I should be telling you is this is the scale factor of your function and is that acceptable to you? So this is the kind of chips that 
uh, APMs need to make in order to start making it useful to engage developers where they are, not in tools that they're not using, but in the GitOps process and the pull re uh, request checks and annotations and the, uh, and the IDE, wherever they're working, and to speak the language of code. Because one of the things that happened is that APMs were essentially an IT tool. And they were never quite able to make the shift to speak the developer language. And I think this is something that will happen sooner uh, than we expect. And um, I, I'm, I'm personally more enthusiastic about just the amazing work that the community is doing to fill the gap in the meantime. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone. Have a great day.